Welcome to the Daily Bolster. Each day we welcome transformational executives to share their real-world experiences and practical advice about scaling yourself, your team, and your business. Welcome to the Daily Bolster. I'm Matt Blumberg, co-founder and CEO of Bolster. And I'm here today with my friend Jeremy Bloom. Uh, Jeremy is the CEO of Integrate. Uh, he and I have been in a VC portfolio together, Foundry Group, for many years. Um, he is a former Olympic athlete, uh, skier. Uh, he's a former NFL player uh, for the Steelers and the Eagles. Uh, he started a nonprofit called Wish of a Lifetime, which is amazing, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, he sold his company, uh, or majority recap, uh, to a private equity firm a couple of years ago and continues to run it and scale it today to epic proportions. Uh, Jeremy, it's good to see you. Always a pleasure, Matt. So, you know, I love doing these Friday, um, more in-depth interviews, uh, and, you know, usually, uh, they're, they're, they've sort of focused on the arc of someone's career and lessons they learned around the way, along the way. And, you know, frequently it starts with someone being a management consultant, or it starts with them being, you know, working at a, a, uh, an at accounting firm, or they're an entry level this or an entry level that it usually doesn't start with, with someone who was a one-time world champion and two-time Olympic skier. Um, but that in fact was your first career, I guess. Um, yeah. It, it is a bit of a non-traditional path to 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 be running a software business as a non-technical founder that didn't go to a graduate school and uh, it doesn't have the pedigree of most executives you know, in and around the space. You've got a graduate school, though. That's the interesting thing. But, uh... Uh, well, the, I went to Wharton through an NFL program, which was an incredible program. I was with the Eagles at the time. And um, the NFL offered an MBA program to go to Kellogg, Harvard, Stanford, or Wharton. And I was, uh, Wharton was in my backyard. So, uh, I'm really happy I went to that program because I don't think integrate would, would be here. And I certainly wouldn't be running integrate if it wasn't, uh, for that program, um, met a, a few professors, including Peter Lenneman, who just to this day continues to be a great ad advisor to me. I was really inspired um, at that at that at that school and at, and at that time and and really kind of helped shape my thinking around what do I want to do after sports you know because you know in the average lifespan of a human being sports ends pretty early for all of us even the professional folks and you know my biggest fear in sports was not <clears throat> not winning an Olympic gold medal or not winning football games, it was, what am I going to do after these, you know, two great experiences in two different sports? And and that fear really was the catalyst to saying yes to, to go into that program at Wharton. Yeah, no, it, it, uh, it's a, it was certainly good on the NFL for, um, for making things like that available. So, um, so like we could talk for much longer than we have today about like every step along the way, but what I'd love to do for, for both skiing and football for each of skiing and football is sort of zero in on one thing that's maybe something you took from there into the into the business world into your professional life so for skiing from the the times i've heard you speak over the years um uh you know my my uh, assumption is that it's something around um e you know either around failure not that you were a failure right you were a tremendously accomplished skier um, but you know, something that happened in, in, uh, the, the final, uh, Olympiad that you participated in, um, and, you know, sort of not meddling, um, you know, what, how, how did that contribute to the way you think about running a company or the way you can think about setting goals or recovering, uh, from setbacks? Yeah. I mean, skiing taught me so much. It's an individual sport, right? So you don't have teammates and, um, at the end of the day, it's it's you against the mountain, and you're either going to be the best in the world that day or or not, and you have nobody else to blame but yourself. It's not like a teammate dropped a pass in the end zone that would have won you the game, and you know you played flawlessly. So I think skiing really really taught me the mentality needed to be on an island by yourself and 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 shoulder all that pressure, and shoulder all those those big moment um, experiences. I think it also taught me. Um, to really enjoy the process, to really enjoy the journey. I mean, young in my, you know, when I was young in my career, 
I would say to myself, I, if I could just make the United States ski team, my you know ski career would be complete. Or if I could just win a national championship, or if I could just win a world championship, or if I could just win uh, a World Cup or the Olympics. And you know, going through my career, um, I, I won all of those, uh, with the exception of the Olympic gold. I mean, I won three world championships, eleven World Cup gold medals. Um, was the youngest skier ever inducted into the United States Skiing Hall of Fame, was the youngest member to ever make the U.S. ski team at 15. So when you look at the arc of, of that career, um, you know, I, I it was pretty incredible. And, but what I learned is like, it's never enough. You know, it, it, you know, just, if you're just looking for satisfaction from a medal or you're just looking for satisfaction with those one things, it's not coming. Like, and I have tons of friends who have Olympic gold medals and, and they want more. So, um, you know, that it, it really taught me to really appreciate, um, and respect the, the daily process, the, you know, the daily grind, um, you know, ultimately whatever we're doing, whether it's skiing or, or football, um, or being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, it is, it, it look, entrepreneurs will frequently go through that same thing. It's never enough, right? The Series A is never enough. The Series B is never enough. Selling the companies, you know, you, you can you can be on that treadmill forever. So that's a that's a healthy way of looking at it. Um, so let's move to football for a second. And the story that sticks with me that I've heard you talk about before is is the lessons you learned about organizational design and culture from the two teams you were on, and and just how different they were. Um, so maybe talk about that for a few minutes and and sort of how that's influenced the way you think about building your own organization. Yeah, my time in the NFL was uh, incredibly enlightening for, for a lot of different reasons, but specifically for being an entrepreneur. I was drafted to the Philadelphia Eagles in, in the fifth round, and I spent a couple of seasons there. Um, our head coach was Andy Reid at the time. And, you know, anybody that knows the Philadelphia media market knows it is really polarizing. And there's a really big magnifying glass um, on leadership, and so I I came to the to the team at a time where you know I think Andy Reid had a tremendous amount of pressure on him to win, and um, you know pe people handled that type of pressure in lots of different ways. The way that the Eagles handled the the pressure um, on management back then was um, they tried to get the most out of the players by uh, managing them based off fear based te techniques, and so commonly. You know, you would hear if you don't do X, Y, or Z, you know, you're out of here, we'll cut you. There's a thousand other players that would love your your job. And, you know, really what that led to, in, in my estimation and experience, was a locker room full of individuals, full of people who were kind of looking out for their, themselves because they didn't want to get cut. They didn't want to be the next person. And so that fear permeated and infected what I would describe as a productive culture and created a bunch of individuals. Right, and and so I was able to so really, different, so different from skiing, where it is you against the mountain. Oh, it's the the total opposite, right? Yeah. Um, and I was able to kind of balance my experience with uh, with that management leadership style and structure with my time with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And um, the Pittsburgh Steelers have been owned forever by the Rooney family. They're a very family oriented um family they're they have an incredible head coach and mike tomlin who to this day is one of the best if not the best leader i've ever been around um but but the the culture was totally different it was flipped on its head it was bottoms up it was you be you be the ceo of your job you you just do your job and we'll we'll take care of the rest and and the the the, the team got to set the goals and be part of the conversation you very rarely you know heard, heard fear based things Mike Tomlin was very transparent. You never guessed where you stood. He would tell you exactly where you stood on the team, what you needed to do to get better. And so that there was no this kind of like, you know, the players versus the organization, or there's no, you know, secrets. You just felt like one. And that that locker room could lock arms and, you know, with Troy Palomalu and, and Heinz Ward and Ben Roethlisberger, we had a great team. I think not as talented as, as the roster that I was part of in, in Philly, we never went past the first round of the playoffs. And in 2008, uh, when I was part of the team, uh, you know, Steelers won the Super Bowl. And and I think my belief is they won it through culture uh, because, yes, they were talented and they had good good players on the on the field. But that team had one heartbeat. That team had a connected culture and it was night and day different than the locker room in Philly. And when you started uh, Integrate, was that part of like the founding principle? Without question, 
I, I, I wanted to be a bottoms up organization. I wanted to hire everyone that was smarter than I was. You know, I wanted to hire people um, and empower them to make great uh, decisions. Of course, it was, you know, my job to provide the the framework and, you know, the guideposts of how, you know, how, where they can be creative. Otherwise you, you don't have any direction. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always uh, wanted to, to have a culture um, that's built around performance. Like I believe in the Reed Hastings kind of culture uh, playbook at Netflix where it's like, hey, our, our job every day is to add value to the business. That's why we're here. So let's work together to perform well and, and add value. But I've always wanted to have a high degree of creativity and individuality uh, for the team to be able to, to exercise um, their intellect and their pattern recognition and their experience to help shape the overall you know, strategy and execution of the company. Did you always want to be in business? I mean, obviously you were you were an athlete, you knew you were an athlete, but you also presumably knew that that was going to end at some point. Yeah, I mean, I've had a highly successful lawn mowing business at the age of 12 and at a lemonade stand at the age of seven and it did okay. And so, you know, I mean, you know, to be truthful, Matt, uh, I always wanted to be an athlete and I knew pretty young that I want, you know, I told my parents when I was I think 10 years old, I want to ski in the Olympics and play in the NFL. And those were the two sports that I really cared about. And, you know, at a really young age, I've, I've uh, incredibly driven. And the reason I got to where I did was not um, through, through, you know, just great genes. I was the smallest kid on every football field I ever hit. I, it really was through working harder than anybody else and, and attacking every single moment of my life. And, you know, surrounding myself with people that could, could help me become a world champion, um, and, and so I think a lot of that was, you know, uh, through, through, you know, good intention. Um, you know, obviously everyone needs a little bit of luck, right? Stroke luck here and there. But, uh, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to be a football and, and skier. I wasn't sure, you know, if I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But however, when I went to that Wharton program, I, I came out of it saying I 100% want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I, I got the bug. I got the bug at Warden for sure. <laughs> and I actually don't know, did you do something in business before you started Integrate or did you just go straight to founder? Yeah, no, P Peter Lenneman, I, I was talking to him one day and I said, you know, Peter, I want to start a company. And I had this idea. I was still on the Eagles and he kind of laughed at me. He's like, hey man, you need to focus on the playbook. <laughs> like, right. you know, focus on, on football. But he, but he gave me a piece of wisdom that was was just really powerful that will stick with me forever. He said, before you go start a company, you know, straight off the football field, um, go lose somebody else's money first. Like go, go, go join a company and learn the ropes of business. Like you don't, you don't know anything about business right now and you shouldn't because you don't have experience. So he's like, don't go lose your money, you know, opening a nightclub or a restaurant, which 90% of the league does. Uh, he said, he said, go work for, for someone. And I did that. So I, I joined a very small startup in the healthcare space and, and I, they hired me to run customer acquisition marketing of all things. I had no idea what I was doing, none. Um, but I had a fresh set of eyeballs and, and a lot of you know confidence in, in my ability to kind of learn how to sw swim in a new deep end, so to say. And, and um, I was there, I think for like nine or 10 months and, 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 that really shaped what Integrate was because the problem that we solved in Integrate was a problem that we had as marketers right. uh, for that startup. And, and that really led to the founding of it. Um, so so let's talk about Integrate for a little bit. You've started the company 13 years ago, 14 years 13 ago? 13 years ago. 13 years ago. 13. Mm -hmm. um, and I know along the way, definitely some twists and some turns. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, like the like all of them, right, Matt? Like I mean, all, all of them. them. Like all of them. Um, talk about a little bit about the the journey. I mean, I I always said with Return Path, you know, I had the same business card for twenty years, but I didn't have the same job for twenty years. So That's what what sure. were you know if you sort of break down the, the integrate into its chapters, including its current chapter with with a new owner, um, you know, how how do you sort of think about the journey and how you evolved as uh, as a leader mm -hmm. over, over those years? I think of it in kind of you know three main chapters. The the first chapter is what was a media business. We were building just a, a media business, you know, for 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 B two B demand gen. We had to reinvent ourselves in 2014 and become a software business because that media business just wasn't sustainable. 
And at the time we, we just, Matt, we didn't have any cash to do it. I think we had $2 million in the bank and all of our, our, our venture folks around the table said, we have no more cash for you. So, you know, in 2014, we had to, to let go. I think 60% of the team, um, we retained 40%. We thought more would leave, nobody left. And we said, here's the plan. And here's how we're going to go build a software business with our customers that are buying media. And we, we threaded the needle, you know, and it was fun. It was exciting. The pressure was really, really high. You wondered if you were going to make payroll just about every single week. Uh, but you won just enough of new business to to fund that. And that happened for like two or three years. And, you know, over, I think a two and a half year period, we went from $0 of ARR to 11 or 12 million. And we only burned up $1.5 million of cash. Um, and at that point, you know, we, we, uh, we got more interest in raising capital. So that was kind of chapter two. You know, we, we, we called it and coined it building the bridge to SAS Island, this beautiful <laughs> island with trees and palm trees. Like, you know, software businesses are much more predictable to run and, and, and then media businesses. And so, and then chapter three was when we were acquired by Audex. And um, I have, you know, ne- I had never worked for private equity previously. I've heard all the horror stories and I'm sure a lot of them are true, but um, Audex is an incredible firm and they think much more like growth investors. Uh, they don't have their own playbook. They don't have their own bench talent. So they don't come in and say, go hire these people. They don't say, go do these things. They're just really good at asking great questions. So I feel like I'm getting smarter every day, um, around, uh, our, our board members, um, and, and my, my partners there. And, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of M and a capital right now to go, go buy businesses and, and put them to, together with what we're doing. So, I'm really enjoying it 13 years in. I didn't think that I would be here 13 years later, but I but I'm delighted to be here because I, I love to learn. I'm very intellectually curious. And in this next in this kind of third chapter, uh, I think I'm learning more than probably I, I ever have before and and just enjoying it. That's awesome. I mean, look, that's how that's how you want it to be. Um, you know, when you sell the company, but you're still running it, right? You've you've swapped out one set of yeah. owners for another. But uh you're right. I don't think it always works like that. Um has the has so they don't have a playbook so they're not sitting there telling you what to do and micromanaging you um has the change in owner change in board um and and you know maybe learnings you've had from working with a you know new set of investors change the way you uh lead or change the way you operate at all or change the culture of the organization you know i, I don't think it changes the way that i lead i don't think it's changed um our, our culture um, and, and in fact, I can measure that against, uh, you know, several years back, our, our employment engagement surveys that the culture really hasn't changed that that much. Uh, but what has changed is, you know, we're, we're just a more mature organization. We've reached a level of scale where you can really have guiding principles help you make a lot of the decisions. I mean, the rule of 40 or CAC to LTV. I mean, when you're in early stage business, you have to invest so forward to growth to, to get product market fit that you can't always look at these you know, these guideposts and say that they even matter because a lot of times they don't when you're really early venture back. But now, you know, we're, we're, we're a mature business. In fact, we have two product lines that can live on their own now. These could be two different companies. We still have a marketplace media business that's doing incredibly well and is in a, a business of its own. And we have a software business. And, and so we're, we're not, what we're doing now is, is we're building two different business units. We used to be one company, one team, you know, one team, but people were, would wear two hats, you know, go to market media, right. go to market sex. And now we're creating the discipline and surgically, you know, creating two business units with specialists in, in each area. And it's challenging. It really is challenging. Um, and it's nerve wracking, right? Because change can be difficult, especially as you have a 400 plus person team. And, and so, you know, what does all this mean for everybody? Uh, but the clarity of of mission in front of us has never been more clear. So that feels really good. It, it, it always felt a little bit like scrambled eggs of running a business that really should be two different businesses. Yeah. So we're getting that discipline and audits has been really helpful to think think through like what, what's the right structure uh, to make sure we're, we're, we're surrounding our customers in the best way. Yeah, that's great. I mean, look, the number of companies that have multiple product lines that go in and out over the years of, oh, now we're functionally organized and now we're BUs um, and, and back and forth has has left me convinced that there's not a right answer, um, but that, that there's probably a right answer for any given company at any given time. Um, and uh, it, that's interesting to hear that that separation is going well. Um, it certainly gives a lot more focus. There's no question about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's difficult when you have one go-to-market motion 
but a different buyer and a different pricing and different packaging and different positioning. And then, you know, what happens in, in our case is you get this, you know, conflict of, of brand. Who are you? Like, who is integrate? You know, are you, are you this demand generation platform that can fill my pipeline with sales opportunities that's globally compliant, which is our media business? Or are you software to help me manage the efficiency of all of my demand marketing in a more thoughtful way? And that conflict has held us back, especially from a brand perspective um, and a confu- just from a confusion perspective of our customers. So for us, you know, th- this was the, the right answer. The only reason we didn't do this sooner is because, you know, both business units weren't big enough to, to kind of live on their own. You know, it was always a very profitable media business and a software business that was burning too much. <laughs> and right. so we've been able to take the proceeds of the media business and really in- use those to invest in R&D and and now both of those are, are big enough and, and and have a unit economic profile that can can live on their own. And so it's um it's what we're doing. What's that's what we're up to now. Yeah, well that's uh that's exciting. So uh five years from now, are you still running integrate? <laughs> no, I don't I don't think so, Matt. You know, I um the average hold period with with Audax is five to seven years. Uh we're we'll be two years in in December. And yeah, I think there's just a number of um, both strategics and sponsors who are really interested in what we're doing. So I think, look, heads down right now, uh, we want to drive customer value. We want to make it a great outcome for, for the folks at Audix, for our team, um, for for our employees and our, our ex- executive leadership team. But, you know, 13 years is a long time. You made it, did you say 20 at Returning Path? 20, yeah. 20 yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I didn't think I would be here at 13, but I am. And, uh, but I don't think I'll be here in five years. I think I'll be doing something else. Oh, you got a few, a few more, a few more in you there. So I never so, say never, right, Mac? Cause I didn't never. think 13 I'd be here. So we'll see. We'll see. All right. I got two more quick topics for you. Um, let's talk about wish of a lifetime. So you started a nonprofit. You started it before you started to integrate. I did. Um, it's an amazing story, which I'll, I'll let you tell. But uh, the question I'd love for you to sort of wind your way to with it is, uh, you know, I think lot, lots of um, lots of business people and, and CEOs in particular um, are interested in in doing philanthropic things. Many have started a nonprofit. We started one out of Return Path as well. I'd love to hear, you know, kind of a lesson or two from that chapter of your life, um, sort of either what worked, what didn't, what you wish you had done differently, anything like that. <laughs> But start well, with- I think the most the most common question I, I get with Wish of a Lifetime is what why did a 26 year old start a nonprofit for 90 year olds? <laughs> and and I just I had incredible grandparents. I really did. I was really lucky. My my grandmother lived with us in my house uh, in our household for the first 19 years of my life. And my dad's dad, my grandfather, uh, was one of my biggest heroes. In fact, he taught me to ski at the age of three and four by throwing miniature sized candy bars down the slopes of Keystone, Colorado. Um, so, you know, and, and I always felt like, you know, in our country, we need to do a better job of respecting uh, our elders. And, you know, you see that a lot in the Japanese culture. You see it a lot in Scandinavia. It's just fundamentally different how people um, treat and respect and revere it, the the eldest folks in their population. So uh, what we do is we grant lifelong wishes to primarily 80, 90 and 100 year old people. And I've learned a tremendous amount being around folks who are are in the last chapter of life and have experienced a lot of the problems that are unique to you and me and have figured them out. Um, and so there's a lot of untapped wisdom. I always ask them kind of what's the what's the key to life? What's the key to, to longevity? I get a very, very uh, frequent and common answer. Um, never stop moving. Mm-hmm. You know, even when your knees, knees hurts or your ankle hurts, you go take that walk. You know, uh, go read that book. Go go learn that skill. I think you know there's probably a gravitational pull at some some age to kind of tune out or switch off in life and stop doing those things. The healthiest centurions that I've been around, and we've been around a lot of them, um, take that walk, read that book, do that thing, engage in life, figure out a way to to, to stay engaged um, in life. So that that's been a very powerful uh, learning for for me and a, and a lesson for for me. But we love our jobs. We really do. We get to knock on the door of a, you know, 90 year old woman and and say, you know, that wish that you've always had. Well, we're here to make it come true. So let's roll. 
you know, let's let's go get it done. And and what plays out next is nothing short of magical. Being on the grounds of of granting a wish uh, like that is nothing like I have ever experienced. Not any you know winning a ski event or a football like just can't compare. I really can't to the to the, it's just infectious of um, how happy those folks are. So it's been a tremendous journey. Um, it's wish of a lifetime org. You can see all kinds of great wishes on there. We have great videos. Um, and uh, it's been a wonderful journey. My bet, to tie this back to the prior question, uh, having heard you talk about this a number of times over the years, is that the thing you do next, whenever the Integrate chapter is over, is going to have more to do with Wish of a Lifetime than with customer acquisition. That's just a guess. <laughs> I think I, I would bet on that. I, I would I would bet. That's a bet I would take. All right. Let me close with one, one last question, because uh, I know you got to go in a minute. Um, you just published a book, which I believe is your second book, um, mm -hmm. called Recalibrate. Uh, yeah. Tell us about it. Yeah, here's here's the book. Uh, this this squiggly line. There's a you can Google it, and, and you just Google what success looks like. In fact, I put it on the on the first page. It's it's one of my favorite images in life because I think it's so true to no matter what we're doing, like what people think success looks like, but what it actually looks like. Right. And so for those of you just listening on Spotify or Apple, what people think success looks like is a straight line up and to the right. And what success really looks like is a squiggly line that goes all over the place and ends up in a better place. Yeah. And I just think it's so true. And, you know, the, the, there's this falsity in, in, in life, especially around social media, where we only kind of, you know, capture the, the highlight reel. And it's easy to look around us and say, gosh, everyone else's life is so much better or so much easier. And it's just not true. It, we're just not posting the squiggly lines. And, and so I think it's a really powerful concept of, of, of being able to learn how to recalibrate in life. And, you know, no matter who you are, no matter how much success that you've had, you've always had, you know, we're always going to have moments where we need to recalibrate. Um, and our ability to learn how to do that, especially in those moments, I think will predicate where we ultimately end up and if we accomplish the goals that we've set out. So, you know, this was um, this was actually a rewrite of Fueled by Failure, which was my first book. And I, I got the publishing rights back. And that that uh, book, I worked with a, a ghost writer and I just didn't feel captured the true essence of what I was trying to capture. And so I, I did, a, it turned into a new book because it's a full rewrite, but, um, you know, I, I'm really passionate about the topic and, and I love learning about how others think about this in, in their lives because I really do think it is the key um, to success and key to happiness and key to a lot of things that we want in our lives. And we probably don't talk about it enough. We certainly don't learn it in school. There's no class on how to recalibrate. So uh, I was delighted to, to write the book. It's available on Amazon. But uh Jeremy Bloom, thank you for being here today. You do have uh, an extraordinary story to tell. Um, it was great to have you here for a few minutes to tell some pieces of it, uh, but I am looking forward to reading Recalibrate. And uh, uh, you know, even though I've heard you speak a bunch of times, we talk now, I'm sure I'm going to learn a whole bunch of things from reading it. So thank you for being here today and, uh, and for joining Daily Bolster. My pleasure. Always good to see you, Matt. Thanks. Thanks.